Jesus ended his pivotal and heavily symbolic discourse on the bread of life by declaring, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me and I in him. The crowds who had followed Jesus since his miraculous feeding of the 5,000 and the Jewish religious authorities who opposed him were not the only ones who failed to understand his meaning. Even many of his own disciples exclaimed, this is a hard saying, who can hear it? From that time, many of his disciples walked back and went no more with him. Somewhat plaintively, Jesus turned to the 12 and asked, will ye also go away? In response, Peter asked, Lord, to whom will we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. We believe and are sure that thou art that Christ the son of the living God. The expression a hard saying has become a trope for any doctrine or practice that is difficult to understand, accept, or follow. Over the past few years, when I have asked my students what are hard sayings to them, although they mention faith issues and apparent historical problems, they have increasingly spoken of life challenges, challenges that seem to call into question God's love for them, or struggles they often feel they must endure alone without the love and understanding of their fellow saints. Such hard sayings include gender disparities, sexual and other identities, and racial and ethnic discrimination. In addition, they include a challenge that is common to almost all of us, the pain of loss and disappointment, whether it comes from the death of a loved one, poor physical, mental, or emotional health, or lost dreams. These are challenges that do not go away easily. Rather, they are often struggles that we must deal with throughout our lives. While ideally we could all, with Peter, simply respond with seemingly immediate faith, the reality is that as Mormon taught, we receive no witness until after the trial of our faith. Just as Jacob wrestled with an angel till dawn and Enos wrestled all night before the Lord, for so many of us, the trial of our faith often includes long, sometimes lifelong struggles. I submit that these struggles are necessary to our progression, but they are not struggles that we should ever face alone. While it is true that Jesus Christ and his atonement provide us strength, healing, and salvation, in this life, he often suckers and blesses us through others. Employing the image of the church as the body of Christ in 1 Corinthians 12, 27. Quaker missionary Sarah Elizabeth Roundtree wrote, Remember, Christ has no human body now upon the earth but yours, no hands but yours, no feet but yours. Yours, my brothers and sisters, are the eyes through which Christ's compassion has to look upon the world, and yours are the lips with which his love has to speak. This sentiment strongly supports the church's renewed emphasis on ministering, which Elder Jeffrey R. Holland helped introduce by directly connecting it with Jesus' injunction, love one another as I have loved you. The Book of Mormon teaches that the obligation to love and serve one another is implicit in the covenants we make at baptism when we promise to bear one another's burdens, mourn with those who mourn, and comfort those who stand in need of comfort. As part of her instruction regarding ministering, President G.B. Bingham, president of the General Relief Society, noted that the model for ministering to the one is Jesus, who smiled at, talked with, walked with, listened to, made time for, encouraged, taught, fed, and forgave. He served family and friends, neighbors and strangers alike. True ministering is accomplished one by one with love as the motivation. As illustrated by his dialogue with a Samaritan woman, Jesus' love had no gender or ethnic bounds. The result of that encounter, one that flouted so many of the time's cultural expectations and constraints, was that an entire village of Samaritans came to Christ leading the villagers to declare that Jesus was not just the Redeemer of Israel, but the Savior of the world. 
Jesus' interactions were always tailored to the understanding and the needs of the individual. When Martha, grieving at the death of her brother, expressed faith in the resurrection, Jesus responded with testimony, declaring, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die, believest thou this? She responded, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. Conversely, when her sister Mary expressed her grief through uncontrolled tears, Jesus simply wept with her, providing the perfect example of mourning with those who mourn. Significantly, in Mark's version of the story of the rich young man, Jesus showed that his love was not curtailed when one was unwilling or felt unable to follow him. When the young man had expressed his prior obedience to the commandments, the Markan narrator simply noted, then Jesus beholding him loved him. While we have no idea what the young man's later choices in that life or in the spirit world that followed might have been, we can be certain that Jesus continued to love him. Only by learning to follow our Lord's example of testifying to, compassionately mourning with, and persistently loving people in a variety of circumstances can we effectively minister to the one. As aspiring Christians, but still imperfect saints, we may not always understand the struggles of others or even know how to help, but we can always love them creating safe spaces where others, and often we ourselves, can struggle with the hard sayings in life. When I use the expression safe spaces, I do not necessarily use it in the same sense as some in our broader society use it. Rather than alluding to trigger warnings, the effects of microaggressions, or the need to shield ourselves from difficult language and ideas, I am using it to refer to creating environments that are, on the one hand, places of faith where we can seek and nurture testimony, but are also on the other, places where our sisters and brothers can safely question and share their pain. This requires flexibility and sensitivity on our part, requiring that we listen as much as or more than we speak. Sociologist Charles Derber, for instance, has warned of the dangers of conversational narcissism. Sometimes we default to platitudes to avoid uncomfortable situations when we don't know what to say, or in an attempt to find common ground, we shift the conversation to our own experiences rather than just listening or giving supportive examples and responses. Jesus' example with Mary suggests just the opposite. Even harder is overcoming our own implicit and often explicit biases and prejudices. Nonetheless, there is ample scriptural precedent that God loves all his children, and we need to have that same openness. Paul wrote, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus. Likewise, Nephi declared, he invited them all to come unto him and to partake of his goodness, and he denieth none that cometh unto him, black or white, bond and free, male and female, and all are alike unto God. President M. Russell Ballard has taught, we need to embrace God's children compassionately and eliminate any prejudice, including racism, sexism, and nationalism. Let it be said that we truly believe the blessings of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ are for every child of God. Without diluting the doctrine or compromising the standards of the gospel, we must open our hearts wider, reach out farther, and love more fully. By so doing, we can recreate more space for love, testimony, mourning, and agency. We can then find not only peace, but even joy in the midst of the struggle. 
The example of Tom Christofferson provides a powerful example of how love created space for him in his lifelong wrestle with one of his own hard sayings. In his 2017 memoir, That We May Be One, A Gay Mormon's Perspective on Faith and Family, he recounts his own journey with homosexuality in the gospel. Although Brother Christofferson was careful to underscore that his experience was his alone and might not apply to all LGBTQ Latter-day Saints, his journey illustrates what a decisive role love can have as one makes hard decisions about his or her life. A few years after he came out to his family and after he had asked to be excommunicated, his mother ex explained to his brothers and their wives, that the only thing we can really be perfect at is loving each other. The most important lesson your children will learn from how our family treats their Uncle Tom is that nothing they can ever do will take them outside the circle of our family's love. His family did not wait for him to return to church before they could fully love him. And at a much later point in his life, an inspired bishop and the new Canaan ward in Connecticut warmly accepted and supported him, not imposing any prequalifications. While this love eventually helped lead Brother Christofferson back to full membership in the church, it is clear that both his birth and his ward families would have continued to love and fellowship him regardless of what choice he made. We should never fear that we are compromising when we make the choice to love. As Brother Christofferson notes, accepting others does not mean that we condone, agree with, or conform to their beliefs or choices, but simply that we allow the realities of their lives to be different than our own. Whether those realities mean that they look, act, feel, or experience life differently than we do, the unchanging fact is that they are children of loving heavenly parents and the same Jesus suffered and died for them as for us. Not just for our LGBTQ plus sisters and brothers, but for many people, the choice to love can literally make the difference between life and death. Creating space where testimony can give strength and encouragement is another powerful way of ministering to the one. An example of such strength-inspiring testimony is the example of Mormon pioneer Jane Manning Janes, a sister of African descent. Not long after she heard Mormon elders preach in 1842, she joined the church. Like the Samaritan woman, she shared her witness with her family. And that same year, she led eight of them on a journey of over 800 miles from Wilton, Connecticut to Nauvoo, Illinois, much of it by foot, in order to gather with the Latter-day Saints. She was one of the first companies of pioneers to enter the Salt Lake Valley in 1847 and remained faithful throughout her life, even though her husband later left her and she was denied those temple blessings she sought during her mortal life, only being endowed by proxy in 1878. Along with Amanda and Samuel D. Chambers, Elijah Abel and Green Flake, Sister James, or Aunt Jane, was one of the early LDS pioneers remembered at the B1 celebration on June 1st that commemorated the 1978 revelation on the priesthood. While their examples are inspiring to all of us, their faithfulness has special meaning to our brothers and sisters of African descent. Among this number were members of the organizing committee of that event, such as Darius Gray, members who are themselves pioneers and examples of faith and testimony. All of us need to cultivate testimonies of our own, but when we struggle, sometimes we need to know that we are not alone. This is certainly true for the women of the church, many of whom desire female role models as well as the more often talked about male figures of scripture and history. Although I grew up in a family of strong, capable, talented, and faithful women, I did not realize this until I had a heart-rending experience with my only daughter, Rachel, when she was only 11 or 12. 
She was our only child for six years. She was our baby girl. She was my princess. When she was in middle school, I used to drive her to the bus stop each morning, and often as we waited, we would do our scripture reading together. One day, we were reading one of those problem passages in Paul, either 1 Corinthians 14 or maybe 1 Timothy 2, when she looked at me and asked, Daddy, why does Heavenly Father not like girls as much as boys? I don't even know what I was doing reading Paul with the seventh grader. <laughs> Perhaps it's an occupational hazard of having a religion professor as a dad. I could have tried a complicated exegesis. <laughs> Speaking of textual history or dislocation or trying to explain the time and culture-specific problem of the elite women in Corinth and Ephesus. But at that time, all I could tearfully do was testify to my daughter that I knew Heavenly Father and Jesus loved her as much as me. In the years since, I have striven to give my daughter and my students, male and female, models of powerful women of faith and testimony, Old Testament prophetesses such as Miriam, Deborah, Hannah, and Huldah, New Testament disciples, such as Mary, the mother of our Lord, the other Marys and Martha, and latter-day women of Christ like Emma, Eliza R. Snow, even my own mother. In such an environment of testimony, Rachel has grown into a woman of Christ, a senior at BYU, a student of the scriptures, an ordinance worker in the Provo Temple, and one who is important as an individual, not just as our daughter and a sister or a future wife and mother. I'm still learning that in addition to my own testimony, I must find and share faithful witnesses of all sexes, tongues, peoples, and life experiences. When Jesus wept with Mary, he gave her space to share her pain and then extended true understanding. When people struggle with a hard saying, such as our racial history, healing only comes when we listen and acknowledge what they feel. At the B1 celebration, President Down H. Oaks acknowledged such past and current pain noting. Institutionally, the church reacted swiftly to the revelation on the priesthood. Ordinations and temple recommends came immediately. In contrast, changes in the hearts and practices of individual members did not come suddenly and universally. Some, in their personal lives, continued the attitudes of racism that have been painful to so many throughout the world, including the past 40 years. Several years ago, I became good friends with two wonderful, energetic, and spirited women, Tamu Smith and Zandra Vrains. <laughs> Known as the Sisters in Zion, they are African-American LDS bloggers, whom I have often heard describe their experiences, good and bad, as we spoke at events together. I thought I understood and was sensitive to those experiences. But in the weeks leading up to the B1 celebration, I was party to discussions online and in person where I saw their pain and the pain of their sisters and brothers. There were discussions about the difference between celebrating or commemorating the priesthood revelation, a terrible fraudulent letter purporting to be an apology for past racism reopened old wounds. There were even discussions and debates about cultural appropriation. <laughs> such as whether a white ally such as I should even sing a traditional song of Negro liberation. There were things I had not understood, pain that I had not felt, and I needed to resist the temptation to come up with answers or defenses, and instead, I just needed to sit with them, listening and trying to understand. Similarly, this last year, I had a student who once tried to express herself in class. She did so awkwardly, trying to convey an idea that another student quickly countered. Rather ineptly, I tried to bridge the gap. Eager to move the lecture on, I fumbled to close the conversation, which was, ironically, a discussion about the hard sayings at the end of John 6. Later that day, I received an email from the student 
who explained her ongoing struggle with a mental illness. She shared a poem with me, some of the lines of which speak tellingly of our need to listen and try to understand the experiences of someone who struggles. You say, I don't love enough, I don't care enough, I'm not kind enough, I'm not good enough. But you don't see I'm frightened, I'm scared, I'm broken, I'm alone. When we are called upon to mourn with those who mourn, even when it is not an obvious hard saying such as race, mental illness, gender, or sexuality, sometimes we simply need to sit with them to listen and love. Just as Jesus did not compel the rich young man to follow him and allow those disciples who could not bear his teaching to depart, we must make space for agency. Elder Dir F. Uchtdorf, then a member of the First Presidency, noted that today when people leave the church, sometimes we assume it is because they have been offended or lazy or sinful. Actually, it is not that simple. It may break our hearts when their journey takes them away from the church, but we honor their right to worship Almighty God according to the dictates of their own conscience, just as we claim that privilege for ourselves. We have been commanded to love our neighbors as ourselves. And when it comes to neighbors, there are no outsiders. Perhaps even more importantly, even when our fellow saints find themselves outside of formal church fellowship or membership, they should never find themselves outside of the fellowship of our friendship and the circle of our love. This point was underscored to me later in June when I was on tour with the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. On tour, we regularly have singers from local groups join us for our sound check the afternoon before a concert. In Mountain View, California, the local singers were members of the San Francisco Gay Men's Chorus who came in their purple t-shirts and were received kindly and without judgment into the choir stands. Their director, Dr. Tim Selig, was welcomed warmly by Elder Donald L. Hallstrom of the 70 and our choir leadership. And that evening, he conducted the encore at the end of our concert. Our guests included people who may never become members of the church and even a few who used to be members. But together that night, we enjoyed our common humanity and shared love of music. As positive as that experience was, for one of my friends, it was difficult. With his permission, I share just part of his story. Alex is a member of the church, a singer in the choir, committed to keeping his covenants and gay. But as we were building bridges that day, he felt in his terms like he was still under a rock. His continued choice to stay in the church comes at the cost of constant struggle, frequent pain, and considerable loneliness. We sat together for the better part of an hour, during which time he, like Martha, expressed testimony, but like Mary, he mourned. President Ballard has taught we need to listen to and understand what our LGBT brothers and sisters are feeling and experiencing. Certainly, we must do better than we have done in the past so that all members feel they have a spiritual home where their brothers and sisters love them and where they have a place to fellowship and serve the Lord. The psalmist proclaim, weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. Each of us has nights and days of weeping in this life. We all experience loss and pain in its various forms. Almost all of us have lost a loved one. Many of us have lost dreams and hopes. All of us are at the risk of losing health or ability. Yet even in our loss, we can experience peace and joy. We are promised peace in this world as well as eternal life in the world to come. Christ came that we may have life and that more abundantly. I have written and spoken elsewhere about the greatest loss and heartache of my life, the autism diagnosis of our only son, Samuel. Although he was not formally diagnosed until he was four, he had clear developmental delays and challenges with emotional self-regulation from the time he was a baby. Still, we were frantic when he soon began to regress. He stopped smiling, would not let us hold him, 
and began to lose some of the little language that he had. On the day he was finally diagnosed, the child we thought we would have and the dreams we had for him died. Still with early intervention, the help of trained specialists and lots of prayer and inspiration, we have seen miracles small and great. We taught him to smile again and he learned how to receive our love and better express his own. In March 2015, I ordained him a deacon, and he now faithfully passes the sacrament each week. This last year, with the help of his dedicated aide, Kelly Snelson, he com successfully completed his freshman year of high school. While our worries for the future remain, with love, testimony, and support in our heartache, we have much room for joy. The psalmist also wrote, this is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. I witnessed and experienced this kind of joy in the B1 celebration at the beginning of June. After chronicling so much struggle and faith, that event featured joyful songs by a multicultural choir led by Sister Gladys Knight. Over the last 15 years as a member of the Mormon Tabernacle Choir, I've had the wonderful opportunity to sing at many church events in the Tabernacle and the Conference Center. But I have never, I have never felt so much a part of a worldwide church as I did that night as saints, black, Hispanic, white, Polynesian and Asian, joined their voices together in praise of God. I hope you feel this same joy as we watch this video of that choir worshiping God through song and feel free to worship with them. such mornings of rejoicing, we must help each other through nights of struggle. We need to love one another as Jesus loved us. Without diluting the doctrine or compromising our standards, we must open our hearts wider, reach out farther, and love more loudly, making spaces for struggle and faith as we await the final victory, which is assured if we come to Jesus Christ. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. A time to talk, a time to listen, a time to act, a time to sit, a time to testify, a time to weep, a time to embrace and a time to let go, a time to encourage and a time to accept. This is the church of Jesus Christ. I love the wonderful diversity of the mosaic that is the body of Christ. Each beautiful piece, each beautiful piece reflecting the glorious light of God's love. 
as we all wrestle together, may we truly make our families and friendships, our neighborhoods and wards, and our classrooms and offices, spaces for love, spaces for testimony, spaces for mourning and understanding, spaces for agency, and spaces for joy. Thanks be to God who has given us this victory in Jesus Christ our Lord. In the holy name of Jesus Christ, amen.